Good morning. Good morning. I am Sally Morton, Dean of the College of Science. Uh, thank you so much for joining me here in Blacksburg and for all of you joining us via webinar, thank you as well. I am delighted to be presenting the first State of the College Address for the College of Science. So let me begin by saying thank you. Thank you for being so gracious and welcoming to me since I arrived on July 1st. And I'd like to start this talk by celebrating the College of Science, celebrating all of you, your accomplishments in education and research and in engagement. Take the time, take a moment to reflect on your accomplishments and those of your colleagues and those of your students and what this College of Science has accomplished and thank you. Uh, prior to my arrival at Virginia Tech, I was impressed with the strength of the college and since I've been here, I've been even more impressed with the heterogeneity and the breadth and the contributions that you have made. Thank you. I am honored to be your colleague and I'm proud to lead the college. So let me tell you what we're going to talk about today. I'll give a brief update on the college, who we are. I'll talk a little bit about uh, where we're trying to go and how we will get there, what we've done so far, and the role that you play. At the end, I'll also talk about a decision that I've made to invest in the college in you. I'm delighted to make that announcement. At the end of the talk, we'll open it up for questions. If you're here, uh, of course, question in person. If you're joining us by webinar, uh, you can send uh, questions via Twitter or via email. And after the talk, you'll be sent an evaluation form to give your feedback so we can improve in the future, and I look forward to your comments. So let me talk now about who we are. Our community is broad and it's strong. We encompass a wide array of disciplines and perspectives. This heterogeneity is a strength, but it's also a challenge. We need to collaborate respectfully and collegially. And to that end, and I'll address this in more detail at the end of the talk, I've been working in particular on communication across our college. I'll tell you my ideas and what I've been doing, and I would welcome further suggestions from you. One aspect that binds all of us together, and of which we should be very proud, are the common core values of our college. They are excellence, discovery, and diversity. I see these common core values exhibited every day across the college, and I aspire to show them in my work as well. We are excellent in all that we do in our research, in our education, in our outreach, and in our support of those activities. And we teach our students what it means to be excellent as well. What does it mean to be an excellent physicist or chemist or statistician? Discovery is the key to science and innovation. It pervades, again, all that we do as scientists. Diversity and inclusion are important from both ethical and pragmatic grounds. Diversity makes science strong. When we are diverse in our people, in our insights, in our values and backgrounds, we bring different ideas to the table and we make strong science. So thank you for these values. They've impressed me. I see them in all of you, and they are the common core infrastructure of the College of Science. I've been working with the chairs, the heads, and the associate, director, uh, associate deans in our college to form a vision, and this is our draft vision. We are science leaders who discover, create, inspire, and inform. Now notice I've used the word leaders. We have an important service role at the university, but we need to step up and lead. The university looks to us to lead. What are the next scientific ideas? How should we be evolving scientific education? We shouldn't wait for them to ask. We should be proactive and lead. We are leaders and we are teaching our students to be leaders as well. Everyone in the college belongs to this vision. 
Everyone in the college is essential to achieving this vision. You should see yourself in this vision. This is what we all aspire to be. So if this is our vision, how do we get there? A mission of, is thought of as our present state, and it answers three questions. What do we do? How do we do it? And who do we do it for? Our mission contains both basic science elements as well as transdisciplinary components. Our goal is to further science as well as impact society. We all play a role in this mission. We may not all contribute to every element, but we are all essential to achieving it. So what is our plan for achieving this vision and this mission and achieving scientific significance and societal impact? We've developed the beginnings, the basis of a strategic plan, and it consists of four themes. These themes of integrated science, data and decision sciences, including the adaptive brain, global change, and materials emanate from our strengths in the college. Integrated science not only includes our integrated science curriculum, but also our community and our environment, and it is built on the strong <coughs> disciplinary uh, departments that we have in the college. Those strong basic scientific disciplines provide the infrastructure on which science is built. Our basic science work is essential to moving science forward in our college. Every faculty member, staff member, should see themselves in these four themes. Again, you may not contribute to all of them. You may support them via teaching a basic science class, for example, but we are in all these four themes. These four themes connect to what is going on more broadly at the university in the beyond boundaries work that's taking place across the university. And I've listed on this slide the five destination areas and the five strategic growth areas. And you can see connections between what we are doing in the college and what is being more, done more broadly at the university. That connection is purposeful. It is also necessary. We need to show how we are contributing to the university very purposefully. And that's necessary to gain resources. So we've tried to articulate who the College of Science is based on our strengths, but connect to what the university is doing more broadly. And as I'll tell you a bit later, we've been su very successful in making that connection. So what are we doing now and in the future to implement this strategic plan? So here's the steps that we'll take to achieve our vision. First, departments will place themselves and their objectives in the context of these four themes. This work is just beginning. This is your chance to have your voice from your department say how you connect to these four themes. You are central to articulating how your department and your discipline fits into the college. This work will take place over the next several months and I'm working with the chairs and the heads to start this process. Second, the college leadership, and by that I mean the chairs and the heads of departments, the associate deans, and myself, the dean, are working for you. My job as dean is, in particular is about supporting you and your career, and that's what I try to do every day. Third, the new budget model, which I'll go into more detail about in a moment, is essential, and it will be beneficial to us in moving our strategic plan forward. Fourth, we will communicate with you, with the university, and with the outside world, and I'll spend a few moments at the end of the talk about communication. And last, I want to emphasize again, all of you are essential for achieving this strategic plan, and I'm very excited about talking with you further on it. So let me talk for a moment about the new budget model at the university. So it has an acronym, like most things. It's the PIB. It's the Partnership for Incentive-Based Budget. The key word, there are two key words there. First is partnership, and the second is incentive-based. So far at this university, budgeting has been what is called legacy-based, which means basically you receive the budget you did this 
year before with some few small changes. Moving forward, the university will move into an incentive-based budget where you are given budget that parlays into what you are doing for the university. There's a direct link with the tasks that you are doing. Um, in projections of the, of the model, this college is projected to receive roughly plus 6% on average per year increase in resources. Let me say that again, plus 6% on average per year in resources. That's an increase, it's a needed increase for what we do. The reason for this increase is that fundamentally, the budget model incentivizes the type of behavior that we are already exhibiting in this college, and I'll go into more details in a moment to show you that link. The budget model will be phased in over two years. Next year will be a planning year as the university gets uh, data and metrics in place. The budget model will start to be phased in beginning July 2018. So one more year. We're in the current year, we'll go one more year and then start July 2018. And it will be phased in over two years. So why is this new budget model so advantageous to us in the College of Science? And why is it part of how we can achieve our vision? And what are the essential pieces of our college that feed into that model? That's what I'll go into in a little more detail now. To put it simply, I think of the College of Science as the hub of Virginia Tech. We are the hub of the scientific infrastructure that take all of the scientific work that takes place at the university. In terms of, ev of education, almost every single student at Virginia Tech takes a class in the College of Science. That could be considered a burden, but it is an opportunity to impact all students at Virginia Tech and therefore to have a very wide impact on society. To put that opportunity in numbers, in terms of undergraduate student credit hours, we teach over 220,000 student credit hours to undergraduates per year. That is close to 50% of the undergraduate teaching that take place at the university. As you can see in the bar charts, we are trailed by the College of Liberal Arts and Human Services. We are the highest there in the red and orange bar. On an earlier slide, I spoke about 248,000 student credit hours. That includes graduate student credit hours. This chart just shows you undergraduate student credit hours. Prior to now, we have not been resourced for this teaching load. The new budget model takes into explicit account the number of student credit hours that colleges uh, serve. And our college will now be given resources that match this teaching load. And that is why the new budget model in one way will be so advantageous to this college. And that is why we will see that 6% increase. Student credit hours will matter in the model, but so will majors. This slide shows the number of majors and graduate students, that's the upper dark part of the bars, by college across the university. We come in in about third or fourth place. Engineering, of course, the largest college at the university. Let me show you our majors broken down at the at departmental and program level in our college. I know there's a lot going on in this slide. The main thing that you should see is that by department and program, we've stayed roughly constant in most of our departments. There's been a little move. You can see that large red bar on biological sciences. That's because general biology program closed down last year and those students moved into uh, biological sciences. Let me focus now on the new programs in our Academy of Integrated Sciences and our School of Neuroscience. So this chart takes a couple of those pieces from the previous chart and just makes them bigger for you to see. Two programs in the college have been very successful. They are the Computational Modeling and Data Analytics, the CMDA program, which has grown to over 250 majors now and is edging up to 300. <coughs> The School of Neuroscience, which has just opened, currently has close to 400 majors in it. These programs constitute 18% of the majors in our college and are partially responsible for the increase in majors. 
over time, we've seen an increase in majors in our college. In fact, this year, we, the, we have the highest number of majors ever in the college. This growth in these programs will benefit the college in several ways. First, because the number of majors impacts the budget that we will get from the new budget model, they help all of us. Second, they show that we are at the forefront of science education. They get a lot of attention from the state and from the university. They represent all of us. I've established a work group in the college to look at our new programs. We're starting to have faculty in them that are coming up for promotion and tenure. What are the expectations? Are we mentoring those faculty appropriately? What are the relationships between these programs and the departments? What are the financial arrangements? It's time to take stock of these new programs. See what's working, see what may not be working so well, making any improvements that we want to do. I can commit to you that if we consider new programs in the college, that will be done in an open and transparent manner. But we should be all very proud of these new programs. Students are very excited about them. They are seen, uh, they are often mentioned at the university level, and we should be very proud of their success. And thank you to all of you that participate in these programs. As well as our strong uh, basic uh, departmental majors as well, which have stayed very strong. So let me talk a little bit now about another aspect of your success and about our future, and that is external funding. This funding promotes and supports your research and also our students, and we've been very successful in this regard. I've spent 25 years in soft money environments, and I'm very respectful of the effort that it takes to gain soft money funding. So congratulations, and thank you for your hard work in this regard. You have been very successful with an increase of 20% of awarded funding since last year, and we have a great start to the current year. I wanted to talk a little bit about what we have already done already at the college level to support you. One of the things that uh, was done before I arrived was the gaining of a grants coordinator position at the college level. Uh, this grants coordinator is supported by something called A21 funding. Um, our college staff applied on your behalf to the university for this funding and they were successful. We've recently been joined by Andy Volker. He's uh, joined us from the Biocomplexity Institute. We're really delighted to have him on the college staff. His job will be to work with you on your proposals. He will tend to focus on larger ones or ones that require collaboration, subcontracts, complex ones, but don't hesitate if you're working on a proposal to reach out to Andy and we will do everything we can to support you. This is an example of how we've been successful in starting to achieve our vision. I'm very excited about this addition and we expect this position will increase the number of awards in our college. So let me turn now to people. Uh, the College of Science faculty is growing. We are at an all-time high this year at 228 tenure, tenure track faculty in the college. We've also had an increase in instructional uh, faculty. I'm not going to show you research faculty. This shows our non-track instructional faculty. We are at 71 right now in the college. I am also very excited to share that we hope to have an increase of at least 13 faculty in the college this year. We have 25 current searches taking place in the college. That's an incredible number of searches. I'd like to thank all the members of the recruiting committee and everyone that works on the interviews and staff that support this. This is a tremendous effort. Recruiting is very challenging. Let's get out there, let's do our best to bring the best new colleagues to join us here at the College of Science. These positions support you and your departments, okay, and they allow you to continue to grow and develop in new areas and add to critical mass in areas where you are already strong. So this is extremely exciting. You might wonder, where did this funding come from? It came from three sources. Generally, every year we have retirements and attrition and we thus have a budget to search for new positions, that's one source. 
Also in the Dean's startup, I negotiated for positions. That was another source. And I'm also delighted to say that we received from the university five destination area hires. And part of the reason that we were successful in doing that is we were able to articulate the themes of the college and why we are so central to the Beyond Boundaries effort. I didn't do that. All of you did that, okay? The, all of you that were working on the steering committees and in the destination areas, we were able to take what you were doing, connect it to the strengths of the college, and articulate why we need these resources and why they were important for the university to place them in the College of Science. I would, I'll tell you about the five hires. Uh, one is in infectious diseases. That's related to the Global System Science DA. Three will be in data and decision sciences. And one is in materials. And that's very, very interesting because materials is not a destination area. It is a strategic growth area. Think of those as destination areas in training or in adolescence, okay? They're the, one, the next ones. But we were able, and I was really able as your voice, to say to the provost, not yet a destination area, but the College of Science is so strong in this area, I think you should invest resources there. So that was a success. And I was pleased to do that. I couldn't have done that without you, without your contributions, without the input I got from the steering group. So thank you. But this is very, very exciting. I hope we'll see an increase of at least 13 faculty. Again, recruiting ongoing. Uh, just keep the pedal to the floor and do the best you can. And if I can assist with the recruiting in any way, I've already been involved in a couple of the searches, please call on me, OK? We have a wonderful product to sell here. You should be proud of who you are. Convey this to the candidates and tell them how exciting it would be for them to join us and have their career here at Virginia Tech. So we're going to get all this new people. I know the next question. Where are we going to put them? That's the next question, so I'll, I'll address that. Space. Mars? Space, Mars. Yes, Mars. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Carla. <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> the single biggest challenge faced by the college is finding su sufficient space for its growing programs. Uh, one of the things I've done since arriving at the college, and I see so many familiar faces here, is I've gone out and visited you, which has been great fun. Um, one of the wonderful things about being dean is learning about all the things you do. As a statistician, this is what I've enjoyed my whole career. As a statistician, what you do is you sit down with scientists and you say, tell me about what you do. What are your data? How have you collected them? What are your research questions? And I find that's what I'm doing every day, and it's great fun. So if I haven't been to see your lab or your office or talked with your research group, please invite me. I'd be delighted to come. So the first thing to know is that the provost is conducting a space survey in the spring at the university. We will be part of that. He anticipates that he will find underused or, or perhaps even, even empty space that could be used for other purposes. I'm not sure where it is in the College of Science because whenever I go out to see you, I see space being used as efficiently as possible and even in ways that I didn't think was possible. But um, he hopes that this will open up some space. It's the hallways. The hallways, yes, another Mars and the hallways. Great ideas. I would like to thank you because many of the space problems are solved at the departmental level. They don't even come to the college. And that's because of your flexibility, your inventiveness, the chairs, all the faculty and staff figuring out ways to make things work. Thank you. We try at the college to be aware of everything that's going on, but there are often little changes or even big changes that you make within departments. Thank you very much. In the meantime, in the college, we are exploring all options. There is no optimal solution to this problem, and there's no one solution. So we are trying to explore all options, and I want to tell you what I am doing as dean. The first thing is we are trying to project and plan. So if we think to ourselves, plus 5,000 students by 2022, what will that mean? How many extra classes will we have to teach? 
how many additional instructors will we need? We bring in faculty that need research lab space, what will that? We're just, we're trying to project and plan. I am advocating as best I can, and many of you also advocate for renovations in building. So for example, there are renovations taking place in Daring Hall right now to make new instructional labs, and we're very fortunate that uh, Chair uh, Brenda Winkle of Biological Sciences and others are involved in those renovations because we want to push the university as best we can in the direction we want to go. So we try to be a voice, and many of you are involved in that. Thank you. Collaboration and sharing. The university is very intent on space being shared, equipment being shared. When I say, say space, I also mean the infrastructure, the, the equipment, and so on as well. So for example, we bought a large part piece of equipment, and we're sharing it across labs and across the university. We have to think that way. When anybody comes to me with a startup package, says I want to buy X, one of my first questions is, can that be shared? Because if it can be shared, we can get funding from Theresa Mayer, Vice President uh, for Innovation and Research, also perhaps more from the provost. So we're looking for all of those opportunities. I have breakfast with several deans once a month, and we're trying to strategize. Um, we are, uh, the, the big decision that's come, gonna come out, there's something called the capital uh, plan in which the university puts forward building needs to the state. Uh, I am trying to strategize with other deans to try to get on that list in terms of building. Going by yourself forward, saying we need a college of science building, I don't think that's gonna be successful in this climate. So I'm doing the best I can to strategize. We have people outside of main campus we have people at the Corporate Research Center. We're probably going to have to think how to use that space in the future more. Of course, we have folks in Roanoke, the new medical campus, and we have people in the National Capital Region. There are destination area buildings planned. For example, uh, an analytics building. We're trying to strategize to figure out how we can get space in those buildings, though those are a long way off. Even if they started the process now, that would be five to seven years before those buildings were actually able to be occupied. So we are trying anything and everything, and I welcome your suggestions. We're just trying to explore all options. There's no single solution to this problem. We have to work every angle. And I appreciate your patience, and I appreciate your suggestions. So I've talked about what we're doing uh, in terms of education, I've talked about new faculty, I've talked about space. Let's turn now to philanthropy, but that's because that's also an important piece of achieving our vision. And let me just spend a couple slides on this. When I interviewed here and since I've arrived, I've made a commitment to you on this dimension. I spend about 50% of my time on philanthropy and partnerships for the college. And I really soul searched as I thought about this job. Was this something that I wanted to do in the next phase of my career? And I decided for this college to be successful and for me to be as helpful as I could to the college, I had to commit to this. I had to commit to this big time and not look backwards. So that is what I've tried to do. And you know what? It's easy. It's easy for two reasons. One is because I have wonderful staff led by Jenny Orzelik in the college. They just tell me what to do, they get me to the place. And the second thing is, is all I do is boast about you. And that's easy to do. I, the thing that I need from you is continue to educate me about what you do so I can boast even more. But it's easy, I go in and I say the College of Science is great and here's why it's easy to do this. The university is going to, an, or has already gone to what's called an integrated advancement model, where they've put together university relations, this is communication, okay, with alumni relations, with development. Those are all three integrated together. And we are mirroring this structure in our college. I think that this is the way to make us most successful in this domain. So we've already done that in the college. Advancement allows us to grow. Philanthropy supports our students, supports our faculty, 
supports our infrastructure, it supports our activities like symposia, and we've been very successful in philanthropy, so let me tell you a little bit about what we've done. First, all, first off, overall at the university, Virginia Tech has exceeded $100 million in philanthropy for the first time this year. We secured $3.9 million this year for the college. Let me tell you about some recent gift highlights. We have the Gene Gibbons Graduate Teaching Fellows. Those are in statistics. Gene Gibbons is a statistician who went here. Um, and she's been very generous in supporting graduate teaching fellows. And Chair Ron Fricker has been instrumental in, in garnering this funding, so thank you. We have the Sauer Symposium in Science that will support nanoscience, physics, and neuroscience. Uh, we recently had the Department of Chemistry Advisory Council. They've set up an initiative themselves. So thank you to Jim Tanko and to that board. So what I want you to see in the chemistry work is this doesn't just occur at the college level. Obviously, many of you are working at the department level as well on philanthropy. And as I've said, I've hit the road. 20 plus advancement events in the past three months. I didn't know it had been that many. That picture up there, that's me in Richmond on the stairs that were in Gone with the Wind. That was kind of fun to be there in Richmond. So try to go all, all over. Uh, the university has an alumni participation goal. It's kind of catchy, 22% by 2022. We're at 9% alumni given in the college. So that's something we need to, to improve on, and you're all part of that, getting the word out. And there is an upcoming university that is a university level campaign. It's in what's called the silent phase right now, and it will hit, uh, will become public, I think, in 2017. I have a good 2018? The silent phase will begin in 2017. 2017. Okay, good. And the thing is, we want to be very much part of this capital campaign. So one of the things I'm working on right now is articulating who we are so the College of Science is part of that campaign. That goes back to this alignment. The university is going here, here's where the college is, here's where the department is. So that message is consistent so that we are seen as one of the leaders at the university and that's what I'm working on hard. You should know that we are a donor-centric organization. What that means is when we speak to potential donors, we want to understand their passion. What do they want to impact? We don't come to them with an idea. We talk to them about what their interests are. So we work from a very donor-centric uh, perspective in the college and across the university. So now I want to turn to communication for a moment. It's something I've been working on hard since I arrived at the university. And as I was preparing this talk, I thought to myself, why communicate? And I thought it was important to spend a few minutes on that. Um, I think communication is central to achieving our vision, all right? Why should we communicate? To me, it's a matter of respect, and it raises morale. And also, when we communicate, it's not me just talking at you, though I've been doing a lot of that this morning. It's about me listening. And very often, you know, I hear these wonderful ideas that I'm then able to implement, and I'll tell you about one of them at the end of the talk. What type of communication do we want? We want transparent communication. We want it to be effective. We want it to be consistent. We also want it to be efficient. The last thing I want to do is send you an email every day because you won't read them and they'll waste your time. Okay, so we want to be efficient. So any ideas you have on this score, I would welcome them. Communication requires everyone. The first thing that I've tried to do is empower people in particular, the chairs and the heads and the associate deans. What empowerment means is giving them the responsibility and authority to move forward in their jobs. Guess what? They do their jobs way better than I ever could. So my job is to get out of their way. So that is one of the things that I've been trying to do in my four months here. Communication means not just within the college, but also across the university. Again. All I do all day is advocate for you, and I need to do that with a clear message. I've spent the first four months not only getting to know 
many of you, I see many familiar faces here. I've gone to almost all of the departments. I think I have two more to go to faculty meetings. I've met with staff, I've visited labs, I've met with every vice president at the university, every dean, every head of every institute. Because it is only in that way that I will be able to forge the relationship that, relationships that I need to represent you the best that I can. So I've spent a lot of time on that. Um, I am pursuing all of the elements listed on this slide. For example, state of the college address. I, would, I want to point to two particular bullets. The first is COSFA, the College of Science Faculty Association, led by Carla Finkelstein, who's here in the front. Uh, she and her colleagues are working very hard on updating the bylaws for the association. They have also organized a breakfast with faculty, carrying that on from D. Lainam Chang's uh, uh, previous. He had those breakfast. I'm delighted to carry them on. That will be December 5th. Um, I've also been asked by early career faculty to meet with them separately and we'll set up a lunch for those of you in your early career years in the spring. I've also met with the leadership of COSA, that's the staff association. They've had wonderful ideas and suggestions and I'll continue to work with them and we may set, a, set up a separate meeting with staff. I've also gone out to several departments and talked directly with staff and I would be delighted to continue to do that. We're working in the college to improve our communication with the university governance. Um, many of you serve as representatives of the college on university committees like planning and budget and we have senate representatives and so on. And we want to improve that communication so that we understand what's going on in those committees, what do we as a college need to know, and how can we keep you informed again in an efficient way. And we're improving our website in the college and several departments are as well. So I welcome ideas on how to improve communication and you have a chance with your evaluation form on this session. Uh, we would welcome your ideas and perhaps people come up with ideas during the Q&A uh, in a few moments. Now I'd like to uh, announce an investment in you. I'm very honored to be the first holder of the Lei Nam Chang Endowed Chair, Endowed Dean's Chair. Um, this uh, chair, its funding was raised by our roundtable in honor of our previous dean, Lei Nam Chang, and I see him there in the back. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Chan. With this dean's chair come discretionary funds. I could do a lot of things with those funds. I could travel. I could pay a student to help me with my research. Uh, I could buy equipment, new computer. I could take it home as salary. But I don't think this is my funding. I think this is your funding. The dean works for you, and I think this funding should work for you. As I've gone around to faculty meetings and I've asked for suggestions, one of the things that has come up is people have said, we don't have any pilot funding to try out new ideas, invite a speaker, do a little data collection, just little things. Several people said that at different meetings. So a light bulb went off. I'm gonna invest this discretionary funding in you. And I'm gonna call it the Dean's Discovery Fund. I think this carries on the legacy of Dr. Chang and uh, the visionary work that he did in our college. I think it honors what these donors did when they established this chair. So we'll think through this. Um, it's an investment in you. I believe in you. I think it'll bring new ideas forward. Science never stands still. We have these four themes, but we should be nimble to new ideas. And we'll put out submission guidelines early next term. So start thinking right now about what you would like to apply to the Dean's Discovery Fund for. Okay. So let me close with, let's remember who we, the College of Science, are. We are science leaders who discover, create, inspire, and inform. Our role at the university is to lead. The university looks to us to identify new scientific issues, paths, educational opportunities, engagement opportunities, partners, research areas, and so on. We should not wait to be asked. 
We should not wait to be called upon. We should proactively lead. Everyone in the college belongs to this vision. All of you matter in achieving this vision. And remember when you leave here to celebrate the college. Celebrate your accomplishments, your colleagues' accomplishments, your students' accomplishments. Take a moment to celebrate. I celebrate you, and I thank you for your many contributions. I am very proud to be your colleague, and I am honored to lead the college. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we are at 9.40. I have my clock. Good timing. I open the floor for questions. If you're asking a question or making a comment for here, from here, please wait for a microphone so they can hear you on the webinar. If you're on the webinar, you see the instructions there on the screen. Steven's here. He's monitoring the Twitter feed. And uh, also, I remind you to complete the evaluation form. It will be sent to you, and it will also be on the College of Science uh, website. So I open the floor for questions. Yes, Carla. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the, for the talk and the update. I, I have a question. OK, we, we want to bring more faculty. We want to bring um, more competitive faculty, the best out there. But we don't have a space to even show them. Right. Um, so I mean, a big decision, at least on the experimental area, for um, choosing one particular university or another one is, is access to facilities and the space that the person is going to have. Right. So how can we interview people and tell, I mean, they're going to ask for a space if they are really qualified candidates. Right. And what are we going to tell them about that? We can tell them, you know, we are evaluating the space or we can show something that is not appropriate, right? So I think that's a very, very difficult issue. And I've already seen it in some of the candidates that I've, that I've interviewed and interfaced with. So it's a good point. I think at this time, the best we can do is show them what we have, be honest with what is available. Also, in terms of projecting and planning, trying to think now, we might want to hire someone in a certain area in two years. What can we do to advocate for space? I also continue to believe we have to think out of the box. I know that the Corporate Research Center is not seen as incredibly attractive to people because it's seen as distant. However, we have several faculty uh, neuroscience has space out there. I know that Dan Dr. Nancy Ross, uh, chair of geosciences, has space out there. I think we're going to have to think in that kind of way to enable people to have the space that they need. Space is really variable across the college. I have to tell you, we have state-of-the-art space all the way down to the basement of Robeson, which I, I'm not sure what is the most extreme in that way, but <laughs> we have very difficult space. We have. Uh, math faculty are doubled up in office space. It's not just research lab space. So I realize that's a real problem. If, you, if the faculty can help me articulate exactly what it is we need, but we're not going to be able to ask for everything. But I understand what you're saying. It's a concern of mine, and I will work as hard as I can to fix it. Question in the back. Can you? Hi, uh, Esteban Gassel from Geosciences. Hi. So I think the success of the university and the su success of the college depends on keeping talent here. Mm -hmm. How are we going to keep the best scientists at Virginia Tech and we're going to avoid them to like, you know, the temptation of moving to a place that actually have the resources and the space that they need? Yeah, it's the same. No, that's a very good question, Esteban. Um, so a couple of things that we do is we try to mentor and guide our young faculty so they can be successful and they can see their place in the leadership of the college. But we have to be constantly vigilant about people get, uh, 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 leaving and uh, attrition occurring. One of the reasons that people try to take our faculty is because they're good. So it's actually a compliment of the college, but it isn't a compliment that you want to go too far. And I've seen some of the numbers of people exiting, particularly after they're promoted. You often see people leave then. Um, so again, we want to keep out in front. There were some uh, um, support from the college in this regard in terms of, of raises this year to try to retain uh, faculty as well. 
So it's a constant problem. And again, we just have to try to plan and project for it. I work very hard with the heads and chairs to think about retention in this regard. So a difficult issue, and I would look for people's suggestions on it. Do you have a question from the webinar? OK. Yeah, I have a question from uh, YouTube. How do you see the uh, Dean's Advisory Council and Student uh, Government Association process evolving in the near future? In particular, how can we help to grow the, ma the materials SGA? That's the Student Government Association. Oh, as the Student gov Government Association. Um, so first of all, I appreciate our students that participate both in the Dean's Advisory Council and we have representatives from the Student Government Association, which I am due to meet uh, shortly. They are on my calendar. So I appreciate, I'll appreciate the chance to talk to them in more detail. I think from the materials SGA, we've already been successful in garnering faculty resources. Um, and I think I'll be working with the heads and chairs and would welcome student input on where uh, this theme in our college should go. We are already very, very strong in this area, both uh, across several departments, uh, physics, chemistry, biology, geosciences, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some in this regard. So I welcome their input. It's important to know that in the destination areas and the strategic growth areas, there are several pieces. There's not just the research that's ongoing, but there's also the curriculum uh, uh, development that's looked for from the university. So in the materials area, that is a particular place that students could have a voice um, in terms of contributing to curriculum ideas. So I would welcome that. Other questions or comments? Oh, yes, here. Sorry, I got to walk all the way over there. I'm losing my voice a little bit. I apologize. Thank you. Jim Spatillo from Geosciences. Um, you mentioned at the start um, some of our core values and sort of a vision statement, science leaders who discover, create, inspire, and inform. And then you discussed your plans in terms of developing a strategic plan for the college mm -hmm. and the role of departments in that. And I just wondered um, how you're going to involve the people in the college in giving feedback on these things. So. So yes. in other words, I'd never heard that mission statement right. before, right. and I don't know where it came from, and I've never had a, any role in right. providing input. And so right. I didn't know what your vision was for Absolutely. opening it up for comment. Um, no, that's a very good point. You should, and perhaps I should have stressed this more, you should consider these drafts. I've been working with the heads and chairs and the associate deans on developing some, this, so we could just put it up there and lay it out today. So what I envision happening is now the heads and the chairs will work with their departments, and I would welcome feedback at that time. When you sit there and you make a vision statement, you think inspire, should it be educate, should it be enlighten? I mean, there's a million words you can use, and we'll probably never reach um, a, a set of words that everybody agrees with, but that will be the time where your department will come to you and say, okay, this is the draft, here are the four themes, and that's terribly important, integrated science, data and decision sciences, including the adaptive brain, global change, which is quite broad from cellular to community, and then materials. And that's a place for geosciences to say, we fit in here, or you've missed something, or we don't like this part. So I, I welcome your input. And I didn't mean to say it's a done deal, so thank you for pointing that out. Uh, you have to start somewhere. I'm the type of person, I think it's good to put a draft up and allow people to respond. So thank you for that. There's another question behind you, Mel. It's John Lang from Physics. Um, yes, so hi. I just wanted to follow up on that. Um, I sort of noticed when you went through that, uh, something that I've also noticed with the destination area process, which is that the, the, the themes and destination areas that we're stressing are all very applied, as you might right. expect from an engineering right. university. But the College of Science, I would expect there to be a little bit, a little bit more of an opportunity for basic science to right. find a home. Right. Uh, that doesn't have to be so applied. And, and I, I didn't see that in the themes. I'm sure we'll be creative and find ways to get our basic science in there. Yeah. But I wonder if you could speak a little bit to that. Sure, and that's, and that's a great point, and thank you. So one of the things I tried to articulate is I believe the basic sciences are first very strongly in the integrated science part. When I say integrated science, it's an environment, a community, a place where we provide the infrastructure for the other transdisciplinary science work, if you will. 
And I see the basic sciences as pillars underneath that theme. I also think they play a role in many of the other themes. Let's just take materials. I will say, though, it is incumbent on us to be able to articulate this message to the university. We've talked, we were just talking about this the other day in a meeting. People say, I'm not gonna give a good example. Everybody looks at the pen. It's the thing that writes. They forget all the things that have to happen below that make this pen. We are the things happening below. We've gotta be able to articulate the message of what is the impact of the basic science work on that final pen. And I think that's difficult. I've been a statistician all my life, right? So I do calculations. But when I articulate that what I'm doing is trying to understand what will help homeless people be housed and find jobs, that impact, you have to put it in language that people can hear. It's a messaging thing, I think. So I'm really looking to people like yourself. I want to ask you, tell me how it is, what you do. Help me be able to make that message to the university. We will get lost if we're not able to do this. And I need help with that. But you are here. And when this work occurs in the departments, I would ask you to help articulate that while you fit in. Yeah, it's a good point. People have brought it up on more than one occasion. And it's an important point that we're working on. So thank you. Other questions? <clears throat> John Morris, uh, depart chemistry department. Uh, Hi, John. You uh, mentioned you know, the core values, of course, and, and then went on to speak uh, in length about research and discovery. Mm -hmm. the, the one thing that didn't get mentioned again is diversity. That was one of the, that's the third core value, diversity. Yeah, beyond diversity. Yes. And you didn't expand on that at all. Okay, so I want to give please. you a chance to sure. describe how that fits into the core values and then how you are going to support and promote that right, within okay. the college. Sure, thank you. So we usually think about diversity of people, which is terribly important with faculty, on both the faculty, staff, and student front to have a diverse uh, community. Um, I want to also say we think about diversity of ideas so that we have a group of people that have different backgrounds, different insights and values. And, I, and I'm fond of saying diversity makes science strong. So in particular, um, the university right now has a couple of programs that the college is, is taking advantage of. Um, particularly, I'll just focus on the faculty recruiting front. Um, and I'm trying to be very uh, uh, direct in utilizing those resources. So for example, there is a program right now called the Target of Talent program, which is being led by Dr. Mena Pratt-Clark, who's the Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion at the university, where if our college hires a diverse faculty member, we would be promised a new line next year. So that's very much an incentive for our college to make diverse hires. We are working very hard with recruiting committees to make sure that their pools are diverse. Think about uh, the uh, pipeline because that's often a problem. So that goes back to even K through 12 education. How can we impact that? I'm a woman who's grown up in a male dominated discipline. So diversity is very near and dear to my own heart and I'm passionate about it. But we've got to think about how to use resources in the college to increase diversity. And if we do that, it will be everybody in the college committing those resources. It isn't about the dean making a decision. They're not my resources, they're yours. So we have to make a commitment together that this is what we want to do. So going back, I'm trying to understand what resources we can use at the university level. We are trying to organize our diversity components within the college and trying to think forward, how can we incentivize within the college to increase diversity? And I see that as a focus of the college going forward. Yes, oh, question, hi. Hello, Kristen Cox from Chemistry and also Staff hi. Association. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I'd like to speak for just a few minutes regarding the staff. Sure. Um, there is a, a vision for the faculty, and I wanted to find out kind of your input and what you expected on the staff side of that with the growth that you're looking at for within the college. 
Well, I think the staff are essential. And one of the things I tried to say is even if we are in support roles and I consider myself a member of the staff, we should see ourselves in that vision and in that mission. We are the fuel that make the college run. So I'm very dedicated to the staff. And I know you and I have been working together with COSA and I appreciate your leadership on behalf of the staff. When we think about bringing new faculty, we think about space, we think about infrastructure, which is machines, but we also think about people to support that research. So as we think about growing, we're gonna to have to think about an increase in staff to support that work as well. So that's one thing that's very much on my mind. Um, so I support the staff and I look forward to working with COSA and directly with staff. You are an essential part of this college. Um, and we are com we've committed resources to your association for the staff development fund as well, and I'm pleased to do that. So thank you for bringing that up. Is there another question from the webinar, Stephen? Okay, good. We have just maybe time for one more question, if there is one. Yes, in the back, Esteban. Thank you. I, I just want to make a comment regarding diversity or increasing diversity, and this, this for thank students. You. I think we need a mentorship program. I think the University of Hawaii has been very successful mentoring native Hawaiian students with other members of underrepresented group in the, in, the, in the STEM fields. And I think we need something like that here. Actually, our college supports such a program in collaboration with Dr. Pratt Clark and the College of, college of Agri Agriculture and Life Sciences. We actually have a mentoring program and we've committed, I think, $17,000 of college resources to support that program. It may not be as broad as we need, but that's one piece uh, that we do already support. But I would welcome thoughts on how to, how to broaden that. That is um, terribly important. Thank you, Esteban. Any other comments coming in over the web? Well, I'd like to thank you again and celebrate you again. And uh, I welcome your comments, suggestions, and questions over time. Please email them to me and please fill in the evaluation form. There is a reception out in the foyer, so I look forward to interacting with you there as well. Thank you very much for coming and thank you for your comments and questions. Thank you.